Chapter One of Things Seen in Florence by Elizabeth Grierson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. First Impressions Florence, La Citta della Fiore, the City of Flowers. At the mere mention of its name, visions rise in our minds of all that is beautiful in art and all that is quaint and picturesque and turbulent in medieval history yet it is possible that as we journey thither and draw near the city we may feel somewhat disappointed as the train enters a region of low undulating hills covered in late summer and autumn at least by a mantle of what might be mistaken for low sad coloured brushwood but which is in reality a vast expanse of vineyards and olive yards which take their general note of colour from the dull greeny grey of the olive trees the whole landscape is sadder duller tamer than we expected a study in grisaille as some one has expressed it plainly built farmhouses oblong or square with walls covered with cream-coloured plaster rise here and there among the vineyards and these buildings increase in size and number as the train circles round the shoulder of a hill and we find ourselves looking out over a broad valley many miles in extent this valley although it is covered by the same grey mantle that we noticed before is so studded with tiny clusters of houses and villas that we would take it to be a wide-spreading suburb of some city which has not yet come into view at a particular spot the houses cluster closer together running for a considerable way up the sides of two hills studded with cypress trees which encroach on the valley at this point where the houses stand thickest cupolas towers and domes appear and as the train begins to slow down the sound of church bells rises above the rumble of the wheels we have arrived remarks an italian countrywoman who has shared our compartment since we left pisa and who has been trying to enliven us by telling us how after an exceedingly hot summer the water supplies are running short and that rumours of cholera are abroad which statement luckily for us proves to be entirely false and sure enough before we have realised that we have been gazing for the last ten minutes on the mecca of our dreams the train rumbles into an ordinary commonplace badly lighted station and we find ourselves at our journey's end but when once our luggage has been collected and placed in a vehicle and we are on our way to our hotel or pension all latent feelings of disillusionment vanish for we are carried at once into an enchanted city the architecture of which is so varied and wonderful the paintings and mosaics and little sculptured shrines which look down on us even from the outside of the buildings so strange and suggestive the colouring so marvellous and the memories that are called up so overwhelming that we are tempted for the moment to wonder if there is any other town in europe to compare with it perhaps the first thing that strikes a stranger is the extraordinary variety and beauty of the colouring this is not to be wondered at seeing that the walls of even the poorest houses are washed not with the staring white lime wash which we are accustomed to see at home but with soft delicate shades of yellow and pink and brown which hides all deficiencies and which takes on the most varied effects according to the light which falls on them showing clear and vivid in the burning rays of the noonday sun and soft and mellow and mysterious when that same sun sinks in misty splendour or when the moon rises and the stars peep out as a contrast to the soft fairy-like tints of the walls the roofs of the houses which have such a gradual slope as to be nearly flat are tiled with dull red tiles which turn to ruddy brown as the years go by while the wide timbered eaves which project far out over the street add to the quaint effect and throw a grateful shade on the narrow pavements below in one square we seem to have stepped out of this workaday world altogether into that where the adventures related in the arabian nights took place in another we find ourselves being driven through an open-air picture gallery 
or as our equipage proceeds slowly along a fashionable street lined with richly furnished shops we are suddenly confronted by a beetling fortress not plastered but built entirely of stone on the battlemented roof of which we might well expect mail-clad warriors to appear soon our jehu takes a short cut through narrower streets and under dark archways where the light of day can hardly enter and we would fain call to him to go slowly at a snail's pace if he will so fascinated are we by the glimpses of quaint home life which we see on every side artisans in their workshops women seated on stools on the pavement preparing food for their next meal or having already cooked it eating broth macaroni or beans out of an earthenware pipkin balanced on their knees girls sitting in groups on the doorsteps busy over the finest of embroidery or talking to strangely dressed countrymen who have come in the early morning from the country and who now that their business is over are having a mild flirtation with francesca or julia or teresa before wending their way homewards then some low cavernous archway running under some great palace will be traversed and we are out once more in the broad streets and bright sunshine this time near the arno perhaps where pensions abound and where wide arched doorways sufficiently large to allow a carriage to pass through afford us glimpses of cool courtyards and gardens which although they cannot boast the smooth green turf to which we are accustomed in england are bright with sparkling fountains and gay flowering shrubs we are fortunate indeed if we chance to have an introduction to the owners of some of these enclosed pleasances for then we have the privilege of entering in and feasting our eyes on a tangle of colour the like of which we rarely see pink and white camellias the ivory blossoms of magnolia fire-red pomegranate flowers yellow laburnums purple wisteria heavy sprays of lilac luxuriance of roses red white and yellow and prim little orange trees gay both with blossom and fruit in spring laden with fruit in autumn which are set in green wooden tubs around the edges of the paths besides the flowering shrubs there is a wealth of flowers especially in spring early summer and autumn for in july and august the heat is so great that they wilt and wither but with the exception of these two months flowers are almost always to be found in a florentine garden if we chance to arrive in the city in the early morning especially during the summer months we shall find the streets thronged with people the markets busy the fruit and flower sellers doing a thriving trade should our train be due between twelve thirty and three we might be justified in thinking that all the inhabitants who could afford to do so had gone to the country leaving their houses shut up and that the musical harper known in fairy lore had marched through the streets with his wonderful harp lulling those who had remained behind to sleep although the shops are open there are few passers-by to enter them and all the dwelling-houses present nothing but long rows of windows closed in a most monotonous fashion by sparred wooden shutters like venetian blinds set stiffly in a frame through which plenty of air can enter but which entirely excludes the sun while on all sides are figures of workmen clad in dull yellow blouses who having thrown aside their tools have stretched themselves out face downwards in whatever bit of shade they could find on the broad stone or marble ledges which run round all the large houses palaces and churches and which serve as a convenient seat to any weary wayfarer in doorways under arches or even on the pavement itself and have fallen fast asleep for in italy the noontide siesta is as much a part of everyday life as bed breakfast and supper are in the late afternoon and evening we should find yet another scene outside the cafes are placed numberless chairs and little white covered tables and there the more leisured citizens assemble in hundreds to while away an hour or two in talking and drinking tea eating ices or listening to a band should there chance to be one within hearing as evening advances the working folk are afoot also many of them finding seats on the ledges of the public buildings or the steps that lead up to them here they enjoy the coolness of the evening air 
and when they return to their homes in the narrow and cramped streets they do not always retire within their dwellings but will pull their mattresses out onto a gallery or roof loggia if they are fortunate enough to possess one if not on to the pavement of some quiet courtyard and there they will pass the night End of chapter one chapter two of things seen in florence by elizabeth grierson this librivox recording is in the public domain by bridge and river if the general opinion of those who know florence best were taken as to where sightseeing should begin there is little doubt that the answer would be either at the piazza del duomo or the piazza della signoria but i should go first of all to the ponte vecchio that quaintest of quaint bridges which spans the arno near the centre of the town because it is there more than anywhere else that one enters into the realisation of how things began not only of how the city came to be built but of how the artistic genius which suddenly sprang to birth and flowed over the whole of tuscany in the fourteenth and fifteenth centuries was nourished and fostered not in regular studios and in elaborate surroundings but in tiny little botteghi or workshops where in serving their time as goldsmiths apprentices and learning to model and carve in precious metals such great masters as verrocchio brunelleschi ghiberti donatello botticelli leonardo da vinci perugino and michelangelo learned the rudiments of their art for with the exception of a few open arches in the centre the bridge is lined on either side with a long row of tiny irregularly built shops most of which are occupied by goldsmiths and jewellers these men do not only sell their wares on the old bridge they have their homes and workshops there as well and if we take the trouble to do so we can get many a glimpse into the well-lit workshops which are to be found behind the tiny front rooms and see skilled craftsmen and their apprentices clad in clean linen overalls bending over their benches busy at their work where the living rooms in these tiny houses are it would be difficult to say were it not that one can retrace one's steps to the broad street or quay which runs along the north bank of the river and which is known as the lungarno from which we can obtain an outside view as it were of the ancient bridge then we see that built out from the back of the houses which are crowded upon it there are numberless little extensions odd rooms balconies and loggias which literally overhang the river and cling like swallows nests to the walls of the original buildings it is in these that the families of the goldsmiths dwell and delightfully quaint and cosy places of abode they must be along one side of the bridge rising above the shops is a curious stone gallery which runs the whole length of the structure and loses itself in the houses which crowd down to the water's edge on the southern bank of the river and at the other side in a stately building which abuts on the lungarno having noted all this let us go back to the centre of the bridge and leaning over the parapet under one of the open arches gaze down into the green waters of the arno and think for a moment of the story of the growth of the city and of the part which this ancient structure and its predecessor played therein it will not be wasted time for it will help us to understand better the meaning of many of the things we shall see in florence we think first of all of the etruscans that strange artistic people about whom so little is known who came from the east at least a thousand years before the christian era and took possession of the greater part of northern italy establishing themselves in colonies on the tops of high hills where they could defend themselves with comparative ease against all comers one of these colonies fixed on the hill of fiesole which stands to the north of florence and overlooks the valley of the arno at this point there they built for themselves a citadel and walled town for many centuries while as yet the city of florence was unthought of the etruscans lived and flourished there as they did in other parts of the country then gradually the romans obtained the supremacy and the etruscans became the conquered race 
it must have been in those days when the lords of the world were spreading their network of high roads all over europe that the first little bridge over the arno was built to carry the highway which led to rome then it was that the dwellers in fiesole who through marriage and other causes were gradually losing their individuality and becoming merged in the roman nation came down from their homes on the hilltop and began to build houses for themselves near the end of the bridge in the flowery meadow which lay between the river and the hill on which their city stood this we know because etruscan remains have been found near the side of the old market-place now occupied by the modern and exceedingly ugly piazza vittorio emanuele the little cluster of houses grew and extended till at last it blossomed into a township for which a name had to be found to distinguish it from the parent city on the hill numerous explanations have been given why the appellation of florence was chosen some say that it is derived from the name of a roman general florinus who encamped in the meadow and fell in a skirmish with the fiesolans others that it is a corruption of the word fluentia and that the town was so named because it was situated at the junction of the arno and the mugnone a stream which flows into the arno at this spot but the most popular and reasonable as well as the most picturesque derivation is that the name was taken from the lilies the iris florentia which grew as they grow to-day in wild profusion in the fields when a century before the christian era the distinguished roman general sulla acquired by force of arms the dictatorship of rome he punished all who had sided with his rival marius by depriving them of the roman franchise and bestowing their territory upon his own soldiers the fiesolans and florentines seem to have been amongst the number for the old records tell us that their land was taken from them and bestowed on one of sulla's legions the new colonists speedily gave to florence the character of a roman town laying it out in miniature on the model of rome it was believed to be under the special protection of Marta or mars the god of war and a statue of this god was erected on the north bank of the river near the end of the old bridge a hundred and sixty years later christianity was introduced as early as a d three hundred and thirteen we find a bishop established here who had for his cathedral a little church dedicated it is supposed to san salvador which stood where the magnificent duomo now stands thus at a very early date we find the nucleus of the present city the bridge which was her raison d'etre the church and the market which was held in what had been the roman forum and which existed as the mercato vecchio until not so many years ago with the market-place and the bridge in our minds we can trace for ourselves the gradual growth of the city's prosperity a prosperity which had brought it by the end of the twelfth century to the proud position of a small commonwealth which was governed by its own magistrates and owned no allegiance to any outside power with a high road which connected them on the one hand with all parts of the great continent which lay on the other side of the alps and which on the other led direct to rome and with easy access to the seaports both of the mediterranean and the adriatic the merchants of florence were not content with merely carrying on their business at home but pushed their way farther and farther afield until they were known especially as traders in silk and wool in every part of the known world from syria to great britain and luckily for themselves they were not ashamed of their trades even when they grew so rich and powerful that they lived in palaces and founded families who ranked with those of the nobles of the land but banded themselves together in arti or in guilds and were as proud of belonging to the guild of the hosiers or the silk merchants or the armourers or the goldsmiths as some one at the present time might be of belonging to a family which came over with the conqueror it shows us something of the manly pride and satisfaction which these old italian burghers took in their honest handicrafts when we read that no one not even a noble might become one of the eight priori or governing magistrates of the city unless he belonged to one or other of the trades guilds but although these merchant princes were proud of their city 
and of the means by which she had risen to the position of influence and power which she held they were terribly jealous of one another and no sooner did the head of one family show signs of becoming of more importance than the heads of other families than the latter forgetting for the moment their own petty quarrels banded themselves together to overthrow their upstart neighbour so there were constant frays and fights going on in the narrow streets just as bickers and tulses used to go on between the members of the various scottish clans in the streets of the scottish capital so in order that they might have strongly guarded places of refuge these rich florentine merchants built for themselves enormous mansions which bore and still bear the proud name of palazzi or palaces but which were in reality fortresses and when the doors were bolted and barred could quite well stand a siege if need be these palaces still remain in the streets to-day massive and impregnable as ever and as we walk through their lofty rooms and examine the vaulted ceilings and frescoed walls the wrought metal and quaint woodwork that adorn them we realise what strange contrasts the lives of these city fathers presented they took their full share in the rude and barbarous strife and bloodshed that went on in the streets while at the same time they lived in stately dignity and did all that in them lay to encourage art and culture for awakening in the year twelve hundred and ninety four to the fact that the cathedrals were being built in pisa and siena and not wishing to be outdone in municipal zeal by the signoria of these neighbouring and rival cities they bestirred themselves and securing the services of a skilled architect arnolfo de cambio set to work to build in haste not only a cathedral but a palace for themselves as well in which they could transact municipal business also a palace for the bargello or head of the police and another great church that of sante croce of course arnolfo did not live to see these buildings completed other men had to be found giotto brunelleschi and ghiberti to finish them but it seemed almost as if the need arose in order to call out the latent genius derived perhaps from their etruscan ancestors which lay hidden in many a tuscan schoolboy of that day for not only had the buildings to be completed it was also necessary that they should be embellished so we find the various guilds in their corporate capacities offering large sums of money for an altarpiece or fresco or a bit of statuary to be placed in church or hall or market and youths who had hitherto been content to be apprentices in the workshop of some goldsmith or sculptor vied with each other to obtain the prizes and in so doing succeeded in producing such magnificent works of art that they sprang at once into the notice not only of the inhabitants of florence but of the whole of italy it was when the bargello and the palazzo della signoria were a building that the old bridge on which we stand was reared the earlier roman structure having been destroyed by a flood in thirteen hundred and thirty three nearly six centuries have passed since then and most of the old manners and customs of medieval florence have disappeared swallowed up in the cosmopolitanism of the twentieth century standing on the ponte vecchio however and watching the ordinary everyday life of the people we have two links that bind us to the past one is as we saw before the jewellers and goldsmiths shops with their busy workmen for although the old guilds are now disbanded the craft of the artificer in precious metals seems to have been handed down from father to son and we cannot forget as we look at the tiny cage-like houses that they were specially built for the guild of goldsmiths by cosmo de medici first grand duke of florence it was the same cosmo who caused the covered gallery that runs along the bridge to be built in order that he might have a private means of communication between his two ducal residences the pitti palace which stands on the south of the river and the palace of the uffizi which stands near the end of the bridge on the north the other link is to be found in the renaioli or sand collectors who at all times of the day are to be seen at work either in their boats on the surface of the broad river which flows under the bridge or on the bare stretches of sand and pebbles which border its banks sometimes we would take these men for fishermen sometimes for casual labourers 
and it comes rather as a surprise when we are told that they are a distinct clan by themselves whose occupation has been handed down from father to son for centuries and who are deeply resentful if any outsider tries to push himself into their ranks it was probably the building of the great palaces which called the Reneoli as a class into existence there were good stone quarries within reasonable distance of florence where plenty of solid blocks of stone were to be obtained but the signoria required the walls of their palace fortresses to be as strong as the solid rock so as there was always a plentiful supply of gravel and sand in the bed of the arno brought down in flood time from the neighbouring hills the medieval architects hit on the method of building a double wall of stone and filling in the intervening space with coarse gravel and then completing the process by pouring over the gravel enough cement made of fluid sand and water to form it when the mortar had set into one solid mass which as the centuries have proved is almost indestructible this method of building is obsolete but as a residential town florence is always extending and both in the city itself and in the villages round about there is a constant demand for sand for making mortar etc so that the trade of the reneolo is a fairly lucrative one besides he is a fisherman as well so he has two strings to his bow for when he cannot obtain sand he catches fish and when the day is unpropitious for fishing he turns his attention back to sand there are two classes of reneoli for every sand gatherer has not money to buy a boat so the labour is divided the aristocrats of the profession being the boatsmen or barcaioli who go out on the river and gather in the finer sorts of sand the others are the piaggiaioli who possessing no boats are compelled to remain on the banks collecting what sand they can obtain there and separating it from stones and pebbles by throwing it against a wire screen placed in a sloping position so that the sand goes through the meshes and falls in an ever-increasing heap on the ground behind while the gravel and stones fall back from the screen and are cast away as useless the barcaiolo on the other hand has nothing to do with a spade or a sieve for with his flat bottom boat he is in a position to go all over the river seeking for the sand which after a flood is deposited in little sandbanks in the bed of the arno his boat as we see is of a curious build low at the prow high at the stern where there is a little raised platform the predellino on which the barcaiolo stands when he is punting his little craft along with his long pole trying to locate a sandbank for these deposits vary in situation with every flood when he has found one he moors his boat beside it again with the aid of his pole then lifting his palla which is just another pole with an iron scoop at the end of it he scoops the sand up into the body of his boat until it is so heavily laden that it sinks to the water level then he makes for the shore where he sells his boat load to a carter who in turn sells it to a builder six lire a cart load can be obtained for good sand and as the price is rising it is computed that a reneolo can earn from his dealings in this commodity alone something like fifty pounds a year it is very picturesque to watch these bacaioli at work for in warm weather they often throw off all their upper garments and we see them standing lithe and alert clad only in a ragged shirt and bright coloured sash their supple sunburned limbs showing brown and bronze against the clear translucent green of the river while the wet sand piled at their feet in the centre of the boat glistens and sparkles in the sunlight when the building trade is slack and the demand for sand falls off or at odd times such as the evening when the hard work of the day is done renaioli turn their attention to fishing they find this also a lucrative employment as any fish which is brought from the sea is expensive and can only be bought by the richest section of the community so the fishermen of the arno cater for the general public after they have caught their fish they carry them into the poorer streets in gourds strung to their waists and wander up and down hawking their wares 
no matter whether they fish from the banks of the river or from their boats they never use a line but always a net and the variety of these nets and the different methods of using them add to the variety and interest of the scene there is the betaile a bag-shaped net which is stretched on rings and set in the osiers by the side of the river and the catcher and trappola which are fastened to frames like shrimping nets and pushed in front of waders and the bilantia which we see fastened by four corners to a crossed bamboo and let down from the prow of the boats about eight varieties of fish are to be found in the arno including grogni or eels trota or trout arena or carp and brocioli a fish which needs to be most carefully prepared for cooking as it is poisonous and serious consequences might follow if every care were not taken in preparing it for the table we have already spoken of the colouring of florence as being one of its greatest charms and nowhere can this be studied to greater advantage than from the ponte vecchio and from two other bridges which span the arno above and below it the ponte alle grazie and the ponte santa trinita indeed it is quite impossible to describe the delicate almost unearthly effects which one gets there in varying seasons and at different hours of the day to begin with the river varies in colour as no other river seems to vary a thread of gold under the midsummer sun the chilly tramontana of winter sweeping down from the apennines turns it to a dirty grey or the colour of steel again after a spate it flows into a tawny brown torrent flecked with yellow foam showing by its colour the amount of earth and sand which it carries along with it then when the flood has subsided and the sand fallen to the bottom although the current still flows strong it has changed its hue to a green that is as clear as jade and which will change again to a rosy red in the rays of the setting sun deepening into purple where the shadows fall then there are the houses of the borgo san jacopo and those of the via de bardi which stand with their backs going straight down to the river so that there is not even a footpath between the walls and the water surely if there is a quaint bit of architecture to be found anywhere it is to be found here the backs of those houses are one mass of picturesque towers and gables and overhanging roofs of queer projecting windows tiny lodges and unexpected bits of hanging garden sandwiched in perhaps between a buttress and a balcony over the rail of which the family washing is drying in the sun the houses are old and rather dilapidated for this is one of the most ancient parts of the city but all deficiencies are covered to the casual observer at least by the deliciously soft tints of the lime wash by which the walls are coated different shades of yellow are the prevailing colours here from the palest cream to saffron and orange but fawny tints are to be found also terracottas and pinks fading imperceptibly into heliotrope the dark reddy brown of the tiled roofs gives a restful contrast and these again stand out clear and sharp against the deep blue of the italian sky indeed in summer the view from any of these bridges might be a little too vivid were it not for the sombre background which is formed by the stately cypresses which clothe the hill of san Miniato, which rises behind the old houses on the south as we stand here looking from bridge to river and from river to ancient dwelling houses we notice that the piscatorial art is not confined to the renaoli for here and there at the side of windows set far up in the crumbling walls we see nets suspended by pulleys which the inhabitants let down into the river occasionally and we imagine that it is upon the nature of the catch that the next family meal depends End of chapter two chapter three of things seen in florence by elizabeth grierson this librivox recording is in the public domain by church and palace one the north end of the ponte vecchio leads directly to a street bearing the name of the por santa maria 
and if we follow this for a short distance and then turn to the right along the via vaccareccia we find ourselves in the piazza della signoria which from the municipal point of view has always been the heart of the city there are few public squares in the whole world perhaps excepting of course the acropolis of athens or the capitolium of rome where a more striking contrast can be had between the memories of the past which the surrounding buildings call up and the gay careless tide of present-day life which is constantly surging across its wide pavement facing us as we enter the square from the via vaccareccia stands the massive palazzo vecchio which has been well described as one of the most resolute and independent buildings in the world rising to the height of four stories and built of enormous blocks of stone the sense of grim overwhelming strength is relieved by the beautiful tower the highest in the city which rises above it and which is finished by a crown of stone in which hangs an ancient bell the vacca or cow beloved by the people of florence perchance in olden days this affection was mingled with dread for it seldom rang except as a call to arms or when some danger threatened the city and a council of citizens was hastily summoned la vacca mugia the cow lows they cried to one another as they seized their armour and hurried to respond to its call in front of the palace stand some striking statues the hercules and cacus of bandinelli fashioned by that sculptor out of a block of marble which was chosen by michael angelo in the quarries of carrara but was never used by him a copy of the famous marzocco or lion of donatello and a copy of david by michelangelo the originals of the two last mentioned statues have been deemed too precious to be exposed to the accidents which might befall them in a public square and have been removed to the bargello and the accademia respectively the term marzocco is a puzzle to most people it is the name given to the symbol of the protector of florence and carries us back to the days of the romans when the city was supposed to be under the protection of mars the god of war as we have seen a statue of this god stood near the ponte vecchio but it was washed away by a flood thereafter a lion symbolic of strength and majesty was substituted for the figure of the god and the animal was represented as seated and guarding the arms of the city the marzocco wearing an enamel crown set in gold was placed in front of the palazzo vecchio as a symbol visible to all of the strength and power of the florentine republic and as such was kissed by prisoners of war in token of submission in medieval days a ringhiera or platform was built in front of the palace for the use of the signoria who sat in state upon it to watch the festas held in the square beneath or to hear the proclamations which they desired to issue read by their officers to the attendant citizens it was from this platform which was demolished in eighteen twelve that the fathers of the city watched the martyrdom of savonarola and his two companions on the twenty third of may fourteen ninety eight and it was in the grim old palace behind that the great preacher and his two friends spent their last night on earth and partook of their last communion before they were led out to die to-day the ringhiera is replaced by a flight of stone steps and as we mount them and take our seats alongside some of the beggars and loafers who alas are unhappily so common in italy on the broad stone ledge which runs around the palace it is difficult to picture to ourselves the dire happenings of these olden times so very different are the scenes on which we are looking down true there is a loggia de lanzi at right angles to us across the corner of the square forming part of the uffizi palace recalling to our minds the turbulent age when even the medici did not feel themselves safe without their own private bodyguard of swiss lancers but now it is filled with statuary and forms a shaded refuge from the noonday sun for tired workmen who take their siesta here it also serves as a convenient place where tourists can read or write their letters for the general post office is just round the corner and the ubiquitous seller of picture postcards is never far off while the little street arabs make of it a special playground 
chasing each other with childish unconcern round the base of the perseus of cellini the judith and holofernes of donatello and the rape of the sabines of gianda bologna in the morning especially the whole square is full of life and movement servants with baskets on their arms are hurrying across it on their way to market priests and nuns are returning from mass and the quaintness and variety of their distinctive habits add to the interest of the scene here we see the ordinary black soutane and shovel hat of the parish priest there the coarse loose brown gown and twisted cord girdle the bare head and sandalled feet of the follower of saint francis of assisi following him closely comes a dominican friar in his white gown and black cloak while occasionally we may see a carthusian monk dressed entirely in white this square seems to be the great meeting-place for business men for there are always crowds of them standing about reading the newspapers smoking and talking while on the edge of the pavement close under the loggia dell'anzi as if to accentuate the contrast between medieval and modern times various stakeholders take up their position and sell papers and postcards also cooling drinks of various kinds from lemonade made on the spot from fresh lemons to the most sickly and insipid of syrups on fridays the square is thronged with countrymen who come in the early morning from the surrounding neighbourhood to talk over agricultural affairs and to transact any business which they may chance to have on hand these tuscan peasants present a very picturesque appearance especially in winter when they appear in fur caps and terracotta coats which however are going out of fashion as we sit on this quan of vantage we cannot help noticing that a constant stream of people comes up the steps towards us and disappears under the arched doorway of the palace at our back if we were to follow them we should find that although there are tourists amongst them who are bent on exploring the massive building the great majority pass through the beautiful courtyard of the palace without even taking time to glance at its fountain one of the treasures of florence which was wrought in bronze by verrocchio and presents a boy with a dolphin the fact is that this quiet little courtyard is used as a passage between the square and the via de leoni or the street of the lions so called from the lions that were kept in an enclosure near by as a compliment to scotland and in memory of the scottish king william the lion who on one occasion interceded with the emperor charlemagne for the restoration to florence of her liberty recrossing the square and leaving it by the left-hand corner we enter the via calzaioli or the street of the hosiers which leads directly to the piazza del duomo and which is to-day as it has always been one of the busiest thoroughfares of the city as we traverse it we pass on our left one of the most interesting churches in florence the church of the trades guilds or san michele once a tiny little lombard church dedicated to the patron saints of the lombards and standing in a garden or orchard then transformed into a granary or corn market it gained for itself the curious appellation of san michele in orto from the latin hortus a garden or horeum a granary in the thirteenth century when it was still used as a corn market miracles began to be shown forth according to the historian giovanni venanni by a figure of saint mary painted on a pilaster of the loggia of san michele in orto the fame of these miracles spreading abroad pilgrims flocked from all parts of italy and the offerings which they brought soon accumulated to a very large sum this money was applied to building a beautiful shrine for the madonna the work being committed to andrea orcagna when his task was accomplished the work was so beautiful that the magistrates recognising that it was more fitting that the shrine should form part of a religious building rather than of a public market removed the corn market to another part of the city and the merchants who had become keenly interested in the matter were at liberty to erect the present church in which to deposit the shrine determined that the casket should be worthy of the jewel which it contained they made up their minds that not only should the inside of the church be as beautiful as they could make it with marble and carving and rich stained glass but that the outside should be beautiful as well 
so each of the great trades guilds offered to supply a statue to be placed in one of the vacant niches which had been built in the walls as we look up at these beautiful life-sized figures erected by the most famous florentine sculptures we realize that one of the most extraordinary things about this wonderful city is that priceless works of art can be left exposed as these are in the open street and that they are so cared for and reverenced by the people that it is possible for them to remain there century after century looking down on the stream of life which passes below them without being chipped and broken by stones aimed at them by schoolboy or vandal hands it is true that the most perfect of them all donatello's st george given by the guild of armourers has been removed to the national museum in the bargello but like the marzocco and michelangelo's david it was felt to be too precious to be left outside even in florence the interior of the church is somewhat dark owing to the fact that altars have been erected against most of the windows and in the gloom it is difficult to make an adequate study of orcagna's masterpiece which took him ten years to complete and is said to have cost eighty-six golden florins it has been spoken of as the most perfect example of gothic art in existence a little way farther on the via calzaioli merges into the piazza del duomo that world-famed square in which when we visit it for the first time we would be almost inclined to imagine ourselves in fairyland were it not for the tram-cars which radiate from this centre to all parts of the city and to the surrounding suburbs as well for before us rise three buildings all of which are coated with different coloured marbles white dark green and pink making a picture which is almost startling in its brilliancy these are the ancient octagonal church of san giovanni battista once the cathedral at all times the baptistery of florence the larger and more modern cathedral of santa maria del fiore st mary of the flower which besides being coated with the three varieties of marble which i have mentioned glitters with mosaics and is crowned by a dome of rosy red and loveliest of all the tall slender campanile or bell tower built by giotto which is so delicate in its beauty so calm and fair and stately that it has been compared to the lily of the annunciation the baptistry is the oldest building in florence and as it was built on the site of the roman temple of mars it is probable that the stones of its walls hidden under their coating of marble are identical with those which were employed in the erection of the earlier building this custom of covering stone walls with slabs of marble is peculiar to italy where this costly material is so easily obtained and has probably been handed down from the days of the etruscans as the term used for this special kind of mosaic is geroni from an etruscan word which means small pieces compared with the radiant freshness of the duomo and campanile this curiously shaped church with its worn metal dome seems old and weather-beaten but in its three double gates which stand on the north south and east it possesses treasures which are reckoned among the greatest trophies of art for one of these gates was fashioned by the hands of andrea pisano and the other two by lorenzo ghiberti almost sixty years being spent by the two sculptors on their production it was of the gates on the east which face the duomo and are the work of ghiberti that michelangelo said that they were worthy to be the gates of paradise these however are always closed and entrance must be sought by the north or south gate at all times of the year the interior of the baptistry is dark and cool and it is very restful to pass out of the heat and glare of the piazzo into its dim light and hushed mysterious atmosphere the windows are narrow and placed high up in its walls but they give us sufficient light to let us see the beautiful mosaics set in a background of gold with which the entire dome is encrusted and the massive granite pillars and tessellated pavement of black and white marble which is said to have suggested patterns to the silk weavers when they first settled in florence in the beginning of the thirteenth century but beautiful as the baptistry is in its form and ornamentation its principal interest lies in the fact 
that all the infants born in florence from the days of dante down to the present time have been baptized here the font that we see is old but it is not that in which the poet and his beatrice were baptized that appears to have been a very curiously shaped font having a large basin in the centre suitable for immersion and smaller basins round it these outer basins must have been fairly large however for on easter even when the baptistry was crowded with citizens all of whom were trying to light their tapers from the easter candle a little boy named antonio de cavicinoli fell into one of them and would have been drowned had it not been for dante who in his efforts to lift the child out broke the basin altogether some years afterwards when in the castle of malaspina he was writing and perfecting his inferno he remembers this and tells how in his descent to the nether world the rocks all pierced with many a hole remind him of those stones which in my beautiful st john are found where priests baptize each infant soul whereof not many years back i broke one to save a child that lay a drowning there unfortunately the quaint old method of keeping the baptismal roll dropping a black bean into a box for each boy that was baptized and a white one for every girl did not preserve the names of the newly christened children else the baptismal roll of san giovanni during the thirteenth and fourteenth centuries would have been of intense interest at any hour of the day we may see a baby brought in to be baptized but if we want really to realize what the dim old church stands for in the life of the people of florence we will come here on a sunday afternoon and watch baby after baby each accompanied by its sponsors and a little group of friends and attendants being brought to be received into christ's church for apparently sunday is the christening day and if we have patience to wait we may see as many as twenty or thirty babies receive their names and be received into the fold of christ's church they are baptized in the order in which they arrive and each baby has a ceremony to itself there is often quite a row of christening parties some very poor some apparently in a good social position sitting side by side waiting their turn the infants who are brought from the poorest homes are generally the youngest most of them being only a few days old for the more ignorant italians have still the dread that a child may go to limbo rather than to the blessed paradiso should it chance to die unbaptized bound up with this belief is the superstition that witches may work havoc with an unchristened child but that they dare not tamper with any one who has been signed with the sign of the cross so for both these reasons they bring their children to the baptistry as soon as they can be taken out of doors it is amongst this class that the practice of swaddling children still lingers and although most of the tiny things swaddled or unswaddled wear spotlessly white gowns occasionally one sees a baby swathed from armholes to ankles in stiff corded material after the pattern of andrea della robbia's bambini and carried a curiously stiff motionless little object on a white cushion by its nurse or sponsor in the upper classes it is more customary to wait till the child is a fortnight or three weeks old thus making it possible for the mother to accompany it all the babies rich or poor are brought into church with a covering over their faces and here it would appear to most people the poorer children have the advantage for while the richer might seem to be in danger of being smothered by the coverings of corded silk or satin heavily embroidered with the sacred monogram in gold in which they are enveloped their humbler little neighbours are allowed to breathe through muslin or net each service is gone through carefully and reverently but naturally no time can be lost especially when there is a crowd of babies so two priests are engaged in the work and take the services alternately when one is filling up the certificate and necessary papers for the child he is just baptized the other is busy with a fresh comer however much opinions may differ as to the points of doctrine or ritual i think no one would be inclined to deny as they stand in this time-honoured spot hallowed by so many memories that there is much that is impressive in the symbols used by the roman church in this initial rite 
in the lighted candles held beside the baby by the assistant deacon as an emblem of the light of the gospel in the few grains of salt that are put into its tiny mouth as a sign of the life that is incorruptible in the laying of the end of the priest's stole across its breast as at a certain point of the service it is carried nearer the font as a sign that it wears christ's yoke and in the other lighted candle round which its tiny fingers are clasped after it has been duly baptized and anointed to typify the virtues of faith hope and charity which from henceforth ought to radiate from its life one of the most interesting ceremonies which takes place in the baptistry is that of blessing the font for the coming year on easter even and is performed by the archbishop when he and the clergy who accompany him have taken their places the font is filled with water which the archbishop signs with the sign of the cross thus dividing it into four a few drops of water from each division are then thrown to each point of the compass north south east and west after which the prelate breathes on the water and dipping the paschal candle into it three times invokes the holy spirit in these words may the power of the holy ghost descend into the fullness of this font thereafter the congregation is sprinkled with the newly blessed water and a few drops or two of the oils used in church services the oil of catechumens and the oil of chrism dropped into it the ceremony ending with appropriate prayers and a litany across the square from the baptistry is the duomo that rose-coloured mountain of marble which arnolfo planned giotto and andrea pisano contrived and brunelleschi crowned truly it is a magnificent cathedral second in size only to st peter's at rome but in spite of the sense of rest and quietness and space which its vast and somewhat bare interior gives it is i think its exterior with the life and movement which goes on around it which appeals more closely to most people for like st paul's cathedral in london the noise and stir of the city life surges up to its very doors and the life-sized figures in the beautiful mosaics set above the principal entrances look down tenderly on little children busy with their childish games at the corners of the broad stone steps that lead up to it on tired men and women who at midday find on the broad marble ledge running round the sacred building a resting-place where they may eat their frugal lunch or stretched face downwards sleep peacefully for half an hour or so and on pigeons which flutter up and down preening their feathers in the sun and feasting on crumbs thrown to them by tourists skirting the steps on the north and south run busy streets the starting-place for trams for all parts of the city and the clanging of the tramway bells and hooting of the curious horns carried and blown by the conductors mix and mingle with the cries of passing street vendors in one confused medley of sounds while in striking contrast the sweet-toned bells high up in giotto's campanile far above our heads ring out at stated hours summoning the faithful to mass or vespers or announcing to all the other churches that the hour of the angelus has come if one happens to be in florence at whitsuntide it is worth while ascertaining when the cresima or confirmation is to be held in the duomo and attending it very often this ceremony takes place on the evening of whit sunday when we enter we find that the vast church no longer looks dark and sombre for in the centre of the nave a vast oblong square has been railed off and an altar raised at the east end this square is filled by hundreds of tiny children most of them about the age of six or seven who have been brought in bands each under the care of a parish priest from the various parishes in florence and from the surrounding villages to receive the rite of confirmation which in the roman church takes place at an earlier period than it does in the anglican communion the children kneel facing the altar and as might be expected at their tender years are much more taken up with their white frocks and spotless suits for all parents even the poorest try to dress their little ones in white for the occasion than with the solemnity of the service in which they are about to take part they are restless too poor little mites 
and desperately afraid that they will lose the two necessary adjuncts to the ceremony which they have been well warned not to drop which they grasp tightly in their hot grubby hands these are a certificate of their fitness for confirmation signed by their priest who gave them what simple instruction was necessary and a little band of white silk ribbon long enough to tie round their heads with a little gold cross worked in the centre of it behind the children stand their parents and relations and behind them again tourists and sightseers among whom we must range ourselves presently the archbishop appears in front of the altar accompanied by attendant priests and after saying some prayers begins to move round among the kneeling children preceded by one priest and followed by another the priest who leads the way takes the certificate from a child glances at it and reads out the name the archbishop confirms the child and signs it on the forehead with the oil of chrism just as it was signed at its baptism he then gives it a tap on the cheek to show that it must endure suffering in the flesh and passes on to the next child while the second priest takes the silken band and binds it round the newly confirmed child's head arranging it so that the gold wrought cross covers the cross that was traced in oil these bands must be worn by the children for three days to show that they are not ashamed of the cross of christ and thinking of the homes from which many of their wearers come we can imagine that they will be no longer white at the end of that period one would expect to find the little girls wearing veils for their cresima but this is not so veils being reserved for the first communion which takes place when they are twelve or thirteen at the north-west corner of the piazza del duomo just opposite the campanile stands a plain unpretending building which might be taken for offices of some sort it is however the headquarters of that most famous and unique society which for six hundred years has been closely connected with the history and character of the florentine people the misericordia or the society of the brothers of merciful hearts up till recently we met a little company of these brethren every now and then as we walked about the streets and if we had not heard about them previously we gazed at them in astonishment and wondered who they were for they were clad from head to foot in loose black cloaks and over their heads and faces were drawn curiously shaped black hoods so that they were quite unrecognisable there might be six eight or ten of them walking in procession two and two and generally the couple in front were wheeling between them a long black stretcher covered with black oilcloth as this strange mysterious company passed along all hats were raised by rich and poor alike and no wonder for the men whose identity was thus concealed were on their way to render help to some sick person or first aid to some one in an accident they carried with them all appliances suitable for the case food wine brandy spirits or bandages and they were prepared to take entire charge of any sick injured or dying person attending to them at home conveying them to a hospital or should they be past all human aid caring reverently for the dead body and if need be carrying it to church for the funeral service and afterwards burying it these charitable acts are still performed by the brothers of the order but the stretchers have given place to up-to-date ambulances funerals are always conducted in the evening and it is a picturesque and weird experience to meet a funeral procession when dusk has fallen as it suddenly emerges from some narrow chiasso or alley in front walks a priest repeating the de profundis and accompanied by acolytes bearing crucifix and torches then comes the bier carried by black-robed brothers of mercy accompanied by other brothers who walk on either side bearing flaming torches which light up the surrounding buildings with a lurid light friends and relatives follow some of whom also carry torches and in this manner they pass to some church where a service is held and the body rests all night to be buried next day either in the fashionable cemetery of san miniato or in the humbler god's acre at trespiano there is no respect of persons among the brethren of the misericordia 
its service is voluntary a free will offering and men of all ranks belong to it from the humblest tradesman up through the professional and leisured classes to the king of italy himself it is this spirit of spontaneity and self-sacrifice that has always distinguished the order and it is because of it that the black gowns and hoods are worn to ensure that no member may be recognised as he goes on his errand of mercy and so obtain the praise of men in bygone days a certain number of brethren were always in attendance at headquarters taking the duty by turns and if any case of sickness or any accident occurred which necessitated more help being needed a signal was given from the summit of the campanile and no matter where the brethren who were liable to be called out for service that day were they were expected to leave their work or business or pleasure instantly and repair to headquarters where in a room lined with cupboards the dress of each member was kept nowadays only a few paid officials and one or two of the more leisured brethren remain on duty at the residence as the building in the piazza del duomo is called other members being summoned by a bell call in case of need but the same rule as to prompt attention to the summons obtains at night three brethren and two porters sleep on the premises this interesting society sprang from a very humble beginning its founder was a porter named pietro borsi who lived in the thirteenth century and was employed along with a number of others in carrying the bales of cloth sold at the annual cloth fairs held in front of the duomo on the feasts of st jude and st martin finding that his companions had nothing better to do than to gamble in their spare time and that when they were doing so oaths were common he suggested that for each blasphemous word a fine should be paid and a litter bought with the proceeds which the porters might use in turn to carry home the unfortunate victims who might chance to be wounded in the street phrase which were so common at that time so from the brave suggestion of a street porter sprang the misericordia of florence the patron saint of the society is saint sebastian and on the twentieth of january which is his festival practically the whole city thronged to the little chapel of the society to do both saint and brethren honour having duly said their prayers they sally forth again and buy large supplies of the very special cakes which are baked for the occasion and sold all day long from stalls erected in front of the residence looking across the via calzaoli from where we stand we see a beautiful little loggia which however is closed by an iron grating through which we can see a bas-relief of the madonna and child attributed to arnoldi a pupil of andrea pisano which for many centuries must have been exposed to the open air this is the loggia of the bigallo another old and charitable institution which has done much for the welfare of poor children if we have only seen the loggia dell'anzi and this exquisite little loggia of the bigallo we may think that such buildings were erected in medieval times alone when the streets were so foul and unclean that those who could afford to do so had these open galleries if we may call them so built in order that they might have some place to walk in and enjoy the air apart from the vulgar crowd and that to-day they are only to be regarded as survivals of the past but this is quite a mistake the loggia is a feature and a very pleasant feature too of present-day florentine family life we have only to ascend to the loggia of the palazzo vecchio to see the truth of this for here we are above the city and can look down on a vast expanse of dull red roofs broken by intersecting streets and by the silver ribbon of the arno and as we do so we become aware that a great part of the domestic life of the people especially of the poorer districts is lived on the housetops for almost every house has its roof lodger often very humble and homely just a roof supported by four plaster pillars and a low wall to prevent children falling over the edge many of these lodgers serve the purpose of roof gardens as well for flower boxes are numerous and vines rambler roses and wistaria are trained over the low walls or up against the side of a higher house here we see a busy housewife hanging out the clothes to dry 
there a cooking stove has been erected and the mother of the family is occupied with culinary arrangements while one or two brown-faced children and a long-legged rough-haired puppy are tumbling over one another at her feet in a roof lodger a few streets away a woman sits by her sleeping child busy at a pile of sewing and a bird-cage hangs on a pillar above her head the more fortunate people who have gardens have their lodgers built against their garden walls and often they have these built sufficiently high up to allow them to look over the wall if they wish to do so and down into the streets below so when one is passing through some narrow lane shut in on either side by high uninteresting stone barriers one may hear merry voices above one's head and looking up may see behind the nodding roses or spray of fragrant lilac that peer over the trellis at the top the eager faces of daintily dressed children anxious to get a glimpse of the turisti inglesi end of chapter three chapter four of things seen in florence by elizabeth grierson this librivox recording is in the public domain by church and palace too it is impossible in a book of this size to do more than mention some of the other churches and palaces of florence no matter how full of interest and beauty they may be next to the duomo and the baptistery the most interesting churches are perhaps sante croce in the south-east corner of the city not far from the arno and santa maria novella on the west close to the central station they are in a sense rivals for Santa Croce was built by Arnolfo di Lapo for the Franciscans, while Santa Maria Novella was the chosen shrine of the Dominicans. Consequently, we find, as we would naturally expect to do, that in the one everything seems to bear on the life of the sunny hearted brother of Assisi, on the other, all our thoughts are directed to the sterner and more militant saint of Spain. In the splendid, large, light church of the Franciscans, with its floor of rosy stone we can read the life of the founder of that order in the carvings on the panels of the pulpit and in giotto's matchless frescoes in the cappella bardi here too in a chapel at the end of the west transept we find donatello's famous crucifix which was despised by brunelleschi whose criticism was that the figure hung upon it was merely that of a contadino or peasant not that of the christ everyone knows the rest of the story how brunelleschi set to work to make a rival crucifix in private only letting his friend see it when it hung completed in his room and how the simple-hearted donatello letting fall in his astonishment the eggs which he was carrying in his apron exclaimed in whole-hearted admiration quite untouched by envy ah brunelleschi to thee it is given to make the christ brunelleschi's crucifix is also preserved it hangs in a chapel in santa maria novella as well as being the church of a great order sante croce is the place of burial and a memorial of all those whom florence delights to honour michael angelo takes his long rest here so does machiavelli and alfieri while tablets in memory of dante galileo mazzini rossini and others are to be found in aisles or nave santa maria novella on the other hand is somewhat bare without many interesting tombs or memorials but it is rich in frescoes the most famous being those of ghirlandaio in the choir and those in the spanish chapel which opens out of the cloisters here in an enormous fresco we see the dominicans in their much vaunted character of defenders of the church militant under the guise of black and white hounds the canis domini or hounds of the lord chasing heretics who figure as wolves midway between these two churches in the via del proconsolo we find a church with a beautiful tapering spire which like the dome of the cathedral and giotto's tower can be seen from all parts of the city and which although it has been restored is very ancient and was originally built for a third religious order that of the benedictines 
this is the badia or abbey of florence here the great count ugo of tuscany son of the foundress is buried and his beautiful tomb by mino de fiesole is one of the many works of art which the building contains the special treasure of the badia however is filippino lippi's masterpiece the celebrated easel picture of the madonna appearing to saint bernard another of the massive palace fortresses which are so characteristic of florence stands opposite this church this is the bargello which as we have seen was built at the same time as the duomo and the palazzo vecchio there are many beautiful things in this palace which is now used as the national museum statues by donatello including his saint george his david and his young saint john the baptist statues by michelangelo and by verrocchio delicate terracottas by the della robbias wrought in that mysterious glazed pottery which they alone could produce also some frescoes by giotto in which he has introduced the figure of his friend dante but the most beautiful thing of all is the ancient courtyard of the palace itself its loggia its statuary its colouring its many coats of arms and above all its outside staircase running up to the second storey all form a picture which it is impossible adequately to describe from the bargello it is but a step back to the piazza della signoria and if we cross that square to the loggia dell'anzi we find ourselves at the corner of the enormous uffizi palace which runs on both sides of the street down to the lungarno on the north bank of the river as every one knows the uffizi palace which was built by cosmo de medici is now one of the most famous picture galleries in the world it enters from the loggia dell'anzi and is connected as we have seen by the covered gallery which runs along one side of the ponte vecchio with the pitti palace which is situated on the south bank of the arno there are immense picture galleries in this latter building also but it serves as well for the state residence of the king and queen of italy when they visit their tuscan capital and old retainers of the house of savoy in royal livery keep a watchful eye on all who enter it is fruitless to try to describe the contents of the many miles of galleries through which one may pass in these two palaces countless books and catalogues have been written and compiled on the subject to visit them is a serious yet necessary undertaking and one or two practical remarks may be useful to begin with the galleries in common with the other galleries and museums of florence are not free except on sundays when the entrance fee is once paid there is no readmission so it is well when setting out to do sightseeing of this kind to choose a time preferably in the early morning when a good many uninterrupted hours lie before us moreover in hot weather it is as well to supply ourselves with a light wrap as well as with the sunshade the wrap to be worn inside the building not outside for the thick walls and marble staircases of these old palaces are apt to make the interiors of galleries and museums very cold and the sudden change of temperature from the blazing sunshine outside is liable to produce sudden and unexpected chills this rule is still more applicable in visiting the churches which owing to their marble floors are even colder there is no need for any one who does not especially want to to climb the long flights of stairs in the uffizi a lift is provided in the room where one leaves one's umbrella and for the small sum of twopence halfpenny much needless fatigue can be avoided no reasonable person would wish to attempt the uffizi and pitti galleries the same day that is if they wished to retain any clear impression of even a few of the masterpieces which they contain but every one should certainly walk through cosmo's gallery which is lined with portraits chiefly of the medici family in order to enjoy the fascinating peeps which its windows afford of the river and of the quaint old streets which run between the arno and the piazzi pitti two great churches santo spirito and santa maria del carmine are to be found on this southern side of the arno santo spirito was built by brunelleschi he who gave to the cathedral its rose-tinted dome it is large severe and splendid but it is more noted for its architecture than for its paintings 
very different is it with the Carmine, as the monastic church of the Carmelite order is generally called. Although the greater part of the building was destroyed by fire in 1771 and has been rebuilt in modern style, happily one old chapel, that of the Brancacci, escaped, and here we see some precious frescoes by Masaccio, precious because this gifted painter, who died when he was only twenty-six, gave in the fourteenth century a fresh impetus to Italian painting, which had somewhat languished in the hundred years which had elapsed since the time of Giotto. It was to the Carmine that Perugino, teacher of Raphael, came when, as a poor and unknown lad, he lived in Florence, and struggled to keep soul and body together on a wretched pittance, in order to spend his time in learning the secret of colouring by gazing at Masaccio's wonderful frescoes. There is only space remaining to mention four other religious buildings, two churches, a chapel, and a monastery, before this chapter draws to a close. There are the huge basilica of San Lorenzo, the tiny little church of San Martino, the chapel of the Spedale degli Innocenti, or Foundling Hospital, and the disused monastery of San Marco. San Lorenzo is a very ancient church, which was rather enlarged and embellished by the Medici, who chose it as their family burying place. It had a great, octagonal, dome-capped mausoleum built for the purpose, the Cappella de' Medici, adjoining which is the Sagrestia Nuova, or New Sacristy, built by Michelangelo, and containing six of his most famous works, the statue known as Il Penseroso, which is a life-size figure of the young Duke Lorenzo de' Medici, father of Catherine of that name, a statue of his uncle, Giuliamo, and four other figures which represent night and day, twilight and dawn. Although the members of this famous Florentine house did so much for the interior of the church which they had chosen for their last resting place, they left the outside of the building incomplete, and the rough unfinished brickwork of the façade, which was intended by Michelangelo to be covered with marble and decorated by statues set in the niches, forms a very untidy object in a very untidy square, for this is a poor part of the city, mean and squalid, without being picturesque, and on most days of the week one finds a market in front of the church, the counterpart of which might be found in any Yorkshire or Lancashire town. Here are stalls laden with cheap haberdashery, or with old clothes, with crude postcards, and highly coloured sweets and toffee, while even the crockery is ordinary and commonplace. And one is glad as one wanders through it, swallowing mouthfuls of gritty dust meanwhile that there are other and more picturesque markets to be found in florence yet here browning bought the pamphlet on which he founded the ring and the book the little church of san martino is a striking contrast to that of his brother saint of the gridiron standing in the tiniest of squares in a perfect rabbit warren of narrow streets and overshadowed by tall many-storied houses it yet has some tender memories, and, what is more, a living tie to the affections of the poor folk of Florence, which the larger and infinitely more magnificent building lacks. For memories, we have only to think of little Dante Alighieri, playing with his childish companions outside its walls, for the great poet is said to have been born in a house, now rebuilt, which stands opposite the church and even if the exact site of the house has been forgotten during the long centuries, it is certain that he was born somewhere within a stone's throw of where we stand, and that he was married in this tiny church to honest, capable Gemma Donati. As to the tie that binds it to the hearts of the people, we have only to stand in the doorway at certain hours on certain days, and we will see a strange and touching sight. In the microscopic vestry, where one would naturally expect to see church records and receptacles for vestments, are piles of golden-crusted, freshly-baked loaves, guarded by a kindly official, who regards the curiosity writ large on our faces with an amused smile. Presently, a number of poorly yet decently clad people begin to arrive, in ones and twos, and, slipping quietly into the vestry, produce tickets which they exchange for bread. Some charity, 
we say rather disappointed at such a prosaic ending oh yes but a charity upon which the fragrance of a good man's life ended some five hundred years ago still lingers we get the key to the story when we go round the outside of the church and see an ancient stone arms box let into one of the walls with an inscription above and below these inscriptions tell us that this is the money box of the buon uomini di san martino or good men of saint martin and that the contributions are for the shame-faced poor it was san antonio the much-loved prior of the monastery of san marco afterwards archbishop of florence who founded this tenderest charity and chose and banded together twelve of the most upright men he knew merchants most of them to be the first buonomini to act as his lieutenants in seeking out and succouring those who in the ups and downs of the restless times in which he lived had found themselves plunged from affluence into poverty and who being too proud to beg were in danger of perishing from starvation to the citizens at large he appealed for aid and his appeal was not in vain for money flowed into the old arms box which was new in those days and to judge from the sight that we have just been watching it has flowed in measure at least ever since if the society of the good men of st martin can be described as a tender charity the term is equally applicable to the work that is carried on in the spedale degli innocenti that great florentine institution which for four hundred years has opened its doors to receive and succour those little waifs and strays of humanity for whom at their birth there was neither place nor welcome a visit to the chapel would be incomplete unless we saw over the splendidly equipped hospital as well for money is never wanting in italy for charitable institutions which are fitted out in a manner which excites the envy of philanthropists in other lands the building itself is no grim barrack-like edifice it is light and sunny and airy and everything about it speaks of childhood it is entered by a loggia from the facade of which andrea della robbia's delicious swaddled babies look down on us each from its own circle of blue within in the courtyard another delightful picture awaits us an annunciation in relief also by andrea della robbia where amid spotless lilies and surrounded by a circle of baby cherubs the archangel gabriel is communicating the wondrous tidings to the blessed virgin in the chapel itself we find as an altarpiece girlandaio's adoration of the magi where beside the wise men from the east two little white-robed innocents with sword cuts on their baby heads and halos round their brows join in worshipping the child the hospital is under the kind and capable care of the sisters of st vincent de paul who have under them a number of clean healthy-looking women who act as nurses and who are always dressed in white although the infants if they are strong are only kept in the hospital for six or eight weeks after which they are sent into the country and are boarded out with respectable peasants who bring them up with their own families till they are old enough to go to service the institution is always full and we may walk through room after room filled with tiny cribs like iron clothes baskets which are lined with white and swing from an iron hook each has its own occupant and each occupant has its own medal with a number and a letter stamped upon it tied round its neck this number and letter correspond to a name and address which is given to the authorities when the child is received and entered into a book so that when it is old enough it can trace its parentage if it chooses to do so everything is worked on the newest hygienic principles all the milk is sterilized and kept in hermetically sealed bottles the babies are weighed at intervals on scales protected by a soft covering most fascinating of all to baby lovers at least is the room carefully kept at an even temperature where they are washed on a large table fitted in the centre with hot and cold water and where during the process they lie and chuckle and kick not on the bare boards but on a padded covering which extends over the surface of the table and is protected by oilcloth the same atmosphere of dainty brightness which the della robbia bambini 
shed around the hospital of the innocents lingers also in the shady cloisters and plain little whitewashed cells of the monastery of san marco which stands just a street's length farther on for here fra angelico lived and laboured and his frescoes so exquisitely simple and yet so beautiful meet us at every turn over the door by which we enter the cloister is his saint peter martyr with finger on lips enjoining the dominican rule of silence over another door we see two monks of that order receiving the christ in the guise of a tired traveller opposite us is the angelic brothers crucifixion which we find copied in each of the novices cells each of the cells which belonged to a fully professed brother was decorated by a fresco depicting some scene in our lord's life by fra angelico's own hands and not content with that he painted one of his finest annunciations on the passage wall the good san antonino was prior here before he became archbishop so was savonarola and we can see the double cell which he occupied when in that position with his desk stool and crucifix still remaining in it also a volume of his written sermons dark with age but still quite legible and in a case that hangs on the wall a morsel of his gown and a charred fragment of the wood that formed his funeral pyre. End of chapter 4